Hello YouTube, welcome back to my channel. So today I'm just going to do a quick video on the topic of implied volatility. Now we've covered implied volatility already in this video series. I did, uh, I did it at the end of my video on the Black Shoals model, but I realized it sort of deserves its own standalone video because if, if someone is looking up implied volatility, maybe they don't want to watch a whole video on Black Shoals. Let's talk a little bit about implied volatility, what it is and uh, where we get it from. So when we're pricing an option, there's really just two things that go into the pricing of an option. There is the price of the underlying that, that we're starting with, and then there is the volatility of the underlying, which is how much it moves around. And there are a few other bits and pieces like level of interest rate and so on, but the really important things are price of the underlying and the volatility of the underlying. So therefore we can ask ourselves, we know where we get the price of the underlying, where do we get the volatility? Well. There's a few ways you can calculate the volatility of something, that, which volatility is just a standard deviation, right? So we could take a price history of the underlying. We'll say if we, we look at a company like IBM, right? We could, we could take IBM, uh, go, go online to Yahoo Finance or, you know, one of those places, download the daily price data and calculate the standard deviation, right? And that would then tell us the, the volatility of that stock. Now, there's a few little problems with that. One of the problems is how much data should we use? You know, there's some people and they would say, well, you know, you, you should use as much data as is available, right? So we could then go and say, oh, okay, well, let's take, let's take, I don't know, IBM's been around for 50 years. Let's take 50 years of price data of IBM and we'll, we'll, see, um, we'll see what the, the volatility is and thus, thus we'll, uh, we'll be able to price our options. Now, that's all well and good, but other people would say, well, you know, the problem is that IBM has changed a lot over that time. You know, they're, they're a very different company today than they were many years ago. So why would you possibly, um, why would you think that that old data is helpful? And that's a good argument as well. So then those people might say, well, let's just take, I don't know, six months worth of data because that's the most up to date. That's IBM as it is right now. And we could do that. And, you know, that'll give us a, a, a level of volatility and we can use that to price an option. Now, all of these are great ideas as to how to, you know, come up with a reasonable number for standard deviation. But the problem is that neither of those things are actually what we're looking for because what matters, what, what will tell us that we've perfectly priced our option is to have the volatility in the formula be equal to the volatility of that stock or of whatever that underlying is over the life of the option. So if the option expires in three months, we want to have the volatility be the level of volatility that we'll trade at over the next three months. Now, how do we get that? The problem with that idea is that that's, that is a volatility from the future. We don't know what will happen in the future. So none of those things are what implied volatility is. Implied volatility instead is working backwards. So instead of saying, I need implied volatility to price an option, instead we're saying, no, no, what we have is we have the formula for pricing options, which is a Black-Scholes binomial tree or you know whichever model you want to use. And then we actually have the price that those options are trading at in the market right now. So instead of us trying to work out the price of the option, when actually we know the price of the option, it's the option price in the market right now, what we're going to do is we're going to take the price of the option, we're going to work backwards through the formula, and instead of solving for price, we're going to solve for volatility. So we're going to say that given that this option on IBM is trading at a dollar right now, that means that people expect the volatility of IBM over, we'll say, the next three months to be 20%, for example. So implied volatility is volatility that's backed out of either the Black-Scholes or the binomial tree or really any, any formula you want to use. You basically work the formula backwards 
putting in the price that's observed in the market right now and solving for volatility. And so that then is a forward-looking expectation of volatility. Now, that doesn't mean that that's how volatile it will be, right? Because we, we can't predict the future. All sorts of crazy things could happen in the future and it could be either way more volatile or way less volatile than implied volatility tells us to expect. You know, we, we can't know uh, you know what the future will hold, but we are able to look at the price of an option and we're able to say the market thinks that, that this underlying will either be very calm or very volatile in the future. We're also able to, to compare options on one underlying to options on another underlying. So we're able to say, well, you know, we've got two companies here, Coca-Cola and Pepsi, and one of them is trading at a much higher implied volatility than the other. Now, now we need to work out, is there a good reason for that? Does it make sense? Is it something to do with the capital structure of those companies? Is it something to do with, uh, you know, uh, one of the, the products that they sell or, you know, some upcoming uh, announcement or something like that? Or is there a, a mispricing between the two? So that's what implied volatility is. It's a volatility that we've backed out of the, the options price and it's a forward-looking expectation of volatility rather than something calculated from historic data. Now, that then leads us to things like indexes of volatility. So there's things like the VIX index, and that is an index of implied volatility from S&P 500 options. And so essentially the VIX index is an index telling us what the prices of options are uh, telling us how volatile option traders think the S&P will be over the next short period. Now, I, I won't go too deeply into this, but actually that's even an interesting thing on its own because originally the VIX was just an index that was sort of provided for informational purposes. And then after that, the VIX became such a big thing that people wanted to trade futures on the VIX, options on the VIX. And then it almost has flipped such that people take VIX futures and use those to price options, you know, so it's a kind of a bit of a circular argument at this point. But anyhow, uh, maybe I'll, I'll save uh, that discussion for a future video. Um, so, so that's it for today's video. Um, I've sort of slowed down on doing weekend videos just because I've noticed that no one watches my videos on the weekend. So I'm just doing Monday to Friday videos at the moment. But this weekend I'm planning on putting up two videos that are quite different to this type of video. There's, there's one on Charles Ponzi and one on Bernie Madoff simply because in, in the class that I teach, I, uh, I, I cover uh, Bernie Madoff in the class and I kind of look at, uh, you know, what someone who's knowledgeable about options, uh, is, there, is there a giveaway that Bernie Madoff was a fraud? And so rather than, uh, rather than kind of do the class like I'm doing right now, uh, what I've done is I've, I've sort of created a slideshow slash, uh, you know, almost a documentary type thing. That, that's going a bit far to call it a documentary, but um, I've created uh, two videos uh, that, that I'll put up over the weekend. Hopefully you guys like them. If you do, tell me. If you hate them, let me know that too, and I'll stop putting stuff like that up. Anyhow, have a great weekend and talk to you later. Bye.